Hello and welcome to this Dairy XNet educational video. Today we will hear from Dr. Jan Shearer from Iowa State University addressing an extremely important topic in the dairy industry and how to deal with our non-ambulatory or what is classically called downer cows. Just like to remind those listening to this video that we have other videos available, new articles, and other resources for dairy cattle production at the Dairy XNet site under eExtension. We can, you can also find information about Dairy XNet on Facebook, and that would include announcements of upcoming videos like this. You can sign up for our newsletter, or you can follow Dairy XNet on Twitter. So check out the information on our website. Let me come back and introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Jan Shearer serves the Iowa State University College of Veterinary Medicine as professor and extension veterinarian in cooperation with extension faculty from the Department of Animal Sciences and Iowa State statewide network of county and regional extension specialists he is responsible for the development and delivery of veterinary extension programs designed to meet the needs of Iowa's cattle industries, veterinarians, and the allied agribusiness industry. Dr. Shearer's primary areas of research interest are lameness and welfare issues of dairy and beef cattle. Dr. Shearer is very well known in this area and has worked with the American Veterinary Medical Association in regards to appropriate euthanasia techniques that are used by people throughout the U.S. and worldwide. So I'm very excited to have Jan here with us. So I will now have Jan start his presentation. Well, thank you, Dr. Van Zahn. Uh, it is a pleasure uh, to be able to present this uh, webinar today. And my thanks to the Committee of Dairy XNet uh, for the opportunity to share uh, some thoughts with you on standard operating procedures for non-ambulatory uh, cows. I think this is such an important uh, issue, uh, certainly an extremely important welfare uh, issue, certainly. Um, and um, non-ambulatory cows are a, a common uh, condition in our, in our dairy operations, and so it's very important, I think, that we understand what we're going to do to try to manage these things as they occur. I like this from Wikipedia, standard operating procedures as it's defined by Wikipedia says a set of step-by-step -step instructions created by a business to help workers carry out routine operations. That really uh, says really what I think of in thinking about uh, the concept of standard operating procedures. The whole purpose is to achieve efficiency, quality, and uniformity of performance while reducing miscommunications and failure to comply with the business's objectives. So I think that's a good um, uh, definition of standard operating procedures and tells why uh, these things are certainly important to us. The components of the standard operating procedure would include basic information such as the names of the owner and the farm, uh, where there are health issues, uh, for instance, in involved that we're preparing a standard operating procedure or protocol for, we want to include the name of the veterinarian and possibly uh, others who would have input to that, possibly from uh, that uh, particular uh, veterinary uh, business. The standard operating procedure must outline a plan of action, uh, certainly who is responsible, when or under what conditions, what needs to be accomplished, and how it should be done. Okay, this is really the key components uh, in this standard operating procedure. And I think one of the most important things too is that it continually be reviewed and updated at a minimum, at least annually. And certainly welfare uh, audits and the farm program uh, makes this very recommendation because it's important that these things uh, are reviewed uh, as uh, need be to make sure that they're current and up to date uh, so that uh, we're accomplishing what we need to uh, with that particular procedure. Non-ambulatory cattle are cattle that 
are unable to rise, stand, or walk normally without assistance. Most are dairy cattle, uh, and most develop the condition on the farm of origin. There are a number of conditions, particularly in dairy cattle, metabolic disease disorders, and particularly milk fever, and that kind of a condition that is one of the reasons why this tends to be a more common kind of a condition uh, in uh, dairy cattle. It's important, I think, from some of the work that's been done. We find that less than 1% of these conditions develop uh, during transit or upon arrival at the packing plant or at markets. The reality is that most of these occur on the farm, and so we need a better uh, way to manage these particular conditions uh, on the farm and avoid sending uh, cattle to uh, markets and certainly to slaughter uh, where they're not uh, in a good ambulatory condition because that is certainly uh, a very serious uh, breach in their welfare and uh, certainly not a good thing, certainly from an image standpoint for our entire industry. Non-ambulatory cattle uh, primary causes would be milk fever, calving paralysis, slips and falls, uh, endotoxic mastitis, compartment syndrome, a variety of causes of non-ambulatory cattle. And it's important to understand those and to know how to approach each one of those. And that is the purpose for uh, having standard operating procedures. Let's take a look at milk fever, one of the most common uh, conditions that occurs in dairy cattle. We know that it affects somewhere between 5% uh, or less of dairy cattle. 75% of these conditions occur within 24 hours of calving, uh, oftentimes right after calving, but it can occur, of course, uh, prior to calving. And the experience of myself and many others, of course, that this usually begins with the third calving. I remember as a practitioner, quite often times when I would get a call from uh, someone about uh, the cow being down, uh, they would always ask them, well, is this a heifer or is this a, uh, a little older cow? And when they told me that it was an older cow, then I could be pretty sure that the condition was quite likely milk fever or another complication associated with that. But I knew that that was something that I needed to try to get to and address pretty quickly. The cow is usually down, as we say here, and if you look at the one photograph here in the middle, within 12 to 24 hours of calving, or the rectal temperature is normally uh, in that normal range or slightly below. Bloat is a common condition because uh, calcium is a critically important um, mineral for muscle function and as well for smooth muscle function. And so uh, one of the common uh, problems with a condition like hypocalcemia or milk fever is bloat. So that can be life-threatening in itself uh, if it's not dealt with uh, early on. The treatment, of course, is an intravenous calcium uh, solution. Uh, and uh, normally, uh, when it's delivered quite slowly and, and, and carefully, uh, we can expect a nice recovery, usually very soon uh, afterwards. Other things that might be considered and other things that we would want to put into our protocol as far as how these things should be determined and how one might determine that they're dealing with milk fever would be possibly looking to see that S curve in the neck. The, again, the loss of muscle tone in the neck muscles will turn, uh, will cause this turn in the, in the neck that causes that S curve kind of condition. Quite oftentimes we'll see the typical scene, the muscle paresis. How unable to completely rise, as you see there in that larger uh, a photograph down here at the bottom of the screen, uh, very typical uh, for cows with milk fever. And of course, um, that's a very uh, important indicator, I think, um, of a cow that's with uh, down with milk fever uh, that needs to be uh, treated uh, pretty quickly with, uh, uh, with some kind of calcium solution. Paresis is sometimes confused with paralysis. Paresis is a muscular weakness that's often caused or associated with nerve damage. And so um, there's a slight difference. Paralysis is true uh, nerve damage, a severe nerve damage, but paresis more 
is more of a muscular weakness. Uh, and so what we see with milk fever or hypoglycemia is a paresis uh, that sometimes then, of course, can be or can uh, be a common cause of some nerve damage as a secondary complication. Other complications we need to be aware of in looking at uh, the condition of milk fever are uterine prolapse and, of course, the downer cow syndrome. And again, I'm pointing out and I'm describing these conditions here because as we look at these conditions, it's important uh, that we have built into our uh, standard operating procedures um, information that helps our people understand how to make uh, these, diagnos these diagnoses uh, so that they can uh, know the proper routine to follow thereafter. So uterine prolapse and downer cow syndrome are common secondary uh, complications of the condition of milk fever. Here we're looking at a prolapse of the uterus. If you look in the left uh, upper right, uh, upper left hand corner. We see a prolapse of the uterus here. Uh, the first step, at least for me, was to give intravenous calcium. When I know that the cow is down with milk fever, and that's quite likely the cause of this condition because the muscle paresis and weakness of the pelvic musculature uh, and that weakness then permits the prolapse of the uterus. One of the things then that we want to do is make sure that we treat uh, the milk fever. And I usually start that way as a way to uh, manage this condition because that will also help the uterine muscle begin to contract a little bit and gives me a little bit of an advantage then as I'm trying uh, to uh, replace uh, the uterus in the next few steps. It also gives me a chance to confirm my diagnosis because the passage of manure during the IV calcium uh, administration will help to confirm uh, my diagnosis. And so that's useful as well. So it's a good place to start in the way uh, I would always try to do that. If we look down in the lower left uh, photograph there, we see now the legs, back legs of the cow were pulled backward. That kind of puts the uh, pelvis into a position where it's easier to uh, replace the uterus and then after we have it cleaned up with water then we begin the process of manually replacing the uterus and then at the end uh, deliver any additional calcium you might uh, feel is necessary uh, before you uh, leave that animal. So prolapse of the uterus has a very close connection to of course uh, milk fever and it's one of the uh, common uh, complications. So it's one of those that we certainly need to have a protocol uh, in place for if we're going to have on-farm folks uh, try to manage this condition, uh, then we would need a very clear set of, of uh, protocols and procedures for uh, our people to follow. Or if this is something we want to have our veterinarians to deal with, then, uh, then of course the veterinarian will uh, approach that uh, in the way that uh, they're most comfortable to do it. The other condition that we have as a secondary condition is the downer cow. These are cattle that are down uh, and unable to rise for a period of about 12 hours or more. Um, possible causes again, uh, where we've had a refractory situation to treatment for milk fever, injuries that may be associated with paralysis. And then there's also a condition called compartment syndrome that I'll talk about, uh, that I'll talk about here in, in just a few minutes. Calving paralysis is an important uh, condition uh, as well, and we, we know that around the time of calving uh, that this is uh, one of those potential problems. Uh, sometimes calving paralysis is just associated with delivery of an oversized fetus. Sometimes it's related to uh, a cow that is trying to deliver a calf uh, and is also affected with milk fever at the same time and just doesn't have sufficient strength to deliver the calf and so the calf can become uh, uh, caught in that uh, birth canal in such a way that we get prolonged compression uh, of the uh, nerves within uh, the birth canal, particularly the ischiatic and the sciatic, in other words, an obturator nerves, that can cause a, a calving paralysis a problem uh, later on. Significant damage <clears throat> to these particular nerves can lead to a very protracted 
a non-ambulatory state, uh, and uh, certainly if it's severe enough, uh, the recovery is uh, certainly guarded at best. If we look at where the injury is actually occurring, we can see here in the right photograph here where I have uh, these two arrows uh, here that show that the sacral ridge where the uh, ischiatic nerve roots uh, pass through the birth canal are common places where uh, this injury can occur during the time of calving. And what we see later is actually uh, lesions that don't, may be paralysis and the inability of a cow to rise, or it could be, in some cases, um, it could show itself in very different ways where the cow has the uh, tendency to uh, not be able to keep her legs underneath her. They want to spread, uh, do a, what we call a spread eagle more or less. And so uh, there are a number of kinds of uh, uh, things we might observe when we get damage there. We can also uh, get damage uh, to those nerves in other ways um, besides calving. You can get those from injections, as you see there in part A there on the left. Uh, uh, we can get injections on the side of the leg or even up on the top in the gluteal region uh, in thin-bodied cows. Injections can cause uh, damage to those uh, nerve roots as well. So uh, there are a number of ways that these injuries uh, might occur but certainly the calving paralysis condition is associated with pinching and, and compression of those nerves in the birth canal itself. Here we're looking at the obturator nerve. We used to refer to this quite frequently as obturator nerve paralysis. You see the obturator nerve up here, uh, as I pointed out here with the uh, red arrow. Uh, it's in the birth canal, comes through the birth canal. It serves the muscle group, the adductor muscle group, which are on the inside of the back legs. Uh, and when this nerve is damaged, uh, then those muscles lose their tone. And it's very difficult for the animal then to keep uh, her legs uh, uh, beneath her. They want to do this base wide spread, e spread eagle type uh, of posture, which uh, can, of course, uh, have other uh, complications. One of the ways in which that is dealt with is, of course, with hobbles. The only problem with hobbles is that sometimes uh, they kind of become a life sentence for the cow. And it's very important that unless those are removed at some point, uh, they can cause problems as we see up there in the right hand photograph. They are an important uh, part of the uh, treatment of this condition, but they also reduce the ability of this cow to lie down and rest uh, as comfortably as she normally would because it does restrict movement of her legs. And again, as I say, from time to time, we can get these, if they're not removed over time, uh, they can do uh, some of the kinds of uh, damage that we see there in that upper right uh, photograph. So we need to have clear uh, protocols in place so that these kinds of things don't happen and so that these kinds of things are managed properly. Uh, and that's a good reason and one of the main reasons for uh, some kind of protocol, some kind of standard operating procedure for how those things are to be used and when they should be removed. Slips, falls, and cow-to-cow -cow interactions are part of the daily life of animals as well. Uh, we know that from a lot of various studies that, that usually uh, the slips and falls and, and, and injuries of the upper legs account for somewhere in that 6 to 10 percent or less of lameness conditions that occur. That can be associated with wet uh, concrete, it may be mounting activity and various other things, but in general um, those are conditions that can occur. Toxic mastitis, as we pointed out earlier on, is an important cause of a down cow condition. It results in weakness and recumbency. Uh, it's important to note for uh, cows with this particular condition, there's normally a significant dehydration and watery diarrhea. So those are one of the conditions that we can uh, use, or can, uh, observations that we can use to distinguish, for example, between uh, toxic mastitis and, and um, fever. We will not see uh, watery diarrhea in a cow uh, with, uh, um, normally with a cow with, uh, with milk fever. So that's one thing that we can use then to try to uh, sort out uh, the difference between the two conditions that we may be looking at. 
Treatments for uh, toxic mastitis would include at least uh, calcium and hypertonic saline. And of course, uh, the calcium delivery has to be very, very carefully uh, done in this particular condition. And so um, there are a number of precautions that we can build into our protocols uh, as well that are important to getting this job done correctly. The other condition I mentioned this briefly was compartment syndrome pressure-induced injury to the muscles of the rear legs. It takes very little time for us to develop some pretty serious uh, muscle damage in cows, particularly if they're down on a hard surface. The way this particular condition occurs is when venous blood flow is impeded by it, but the arterial uh, flow is not. So you have arterial blood being pumped into the muscles, but the venous outflow is impeded okay, because of the pressure of this animal lying on this hard surface. This results in a lot of intramuscular pressure, and that intramuscular pressure then can lead to severe damage uh, of the muscles and nerves of the pelvic limbs, and can result in, of course, in a permanent uh, non-ambulatory condition. I think it's important, and again, I've said this before, I'll say it again, that down cows need to be looked at as an emergency situation. The threshold for induction of permanent recumbency in dairy cattle is reported to be as short as six hours. So it's important that we look at this as an emergency condition and make sure that these animals are attended to as quickly as possible. Of 84 periparturian cows down with hypocalcemia, 98%, 83 in other words, recovered when treatment was instituted within six hours. So many have kind of used that as our guideline, that once we reach that six hour point and we start to get much beyond that, the likelihood of recovery uh, from uh, the down cow state uh, starts to uh, uh, regress pretty quickly. So we try to get our treatments uh, done and, uh, and recognize these things as early as possible to give ourselves the best possible uh, outcome. It's important then, I guess, and what I'm trying to really say again, coming back to why it's important to have standard operating procedures is we need to have a plan. We need to determine what the procedure is going to be. We need to be sure the equipment uh, that we are going to use is available. That people understand uh, how to use it. We need to know that people know themselves who are going to be responsible, who's going to be responsible uh, to do these things. This plan needs to be written down. Every herd should have a protocol or a set of standard operating procedures for how they're going to deal with these conditions. Then we need to rehearse the plan. You don't just talk about it, but you go out and rehearse it. Walk yourself through it and make sure uh, that it's going to work. Then you implement the plan as, as uh, it is necessary to do so, and then review it and revise it uh, as you need to at least annually, and in many cases, I would say, depending on what turnover might be, uh, possibly more so. But it's so important that uh, you have a plan in place. So let's just go through and just look at a couple of non-ambulatory cattle standard operating procedures here, for example. One of the things that is a, a basic part of these um, kinds of uh, documents is you have the farm name, obviously, the farm owner, manager, veterinarian, the practice name, the phone number, okay, and when was this revised or reviewed uh, lately? Most of the time when we're doing uh, welfare audits these days, auditors will ask, when was this revised? And they want to see that this has been looked at uh, within the last year at least, and in some cases more frequently than that which indicates that you are doing all those things we've just talked about in terms of making sure that we've rehearsed the plan, making sure uh, that the plan is working, and making sure that uh, we're making necessary revisions as we uh, move forward. The other thing that's important to have in this non-ambulatory cow standard operating procedure, I think, is basically what is the objective of the particular standard operating procedure. So one for non-ambulatory cows, would be to provide immediate relief and treatment of down cows to aid recovery and prevent the permanent non-ambulatory state. And again, to point out that down cows are emergency situations. This tells us why we're doing this. This tells us why 
uh, this is an important uh, uh, thing for our people to understand. The definition of an unambulatory or down cow, uh, what is that? Well, it's any animal that is down, non-ambulatory, and able to rise or stand and walk. And who are the people responsible? All right, the designated animal technician, uh, maybe the down cow team. Uh, these are the people that need to uh, spring into action whenever these things kind of attend, uh, will occur. And it's important then to make sure that all this is spelled out and so all of this is clear that what and who is going to be uh, involved in these kinds of things observed. Down cow, let's, say, let's take a, a down cow uh, standard operating procedure where the cow is down and, and we suspect maybe it's trauma or injury, for example, maybe a cow in mid-lactation. So we're not thinking so much about milk fever as a cause. And as we look at this cow, we don't see any evidence of, you know, uh, some uh, diarrhea, or we don't see any evidence maybe of a, a hard quarters and a quick cursory examination. But we think maybe this animal's down due to suspect the trauma or injury. If that's the case, then we need to examine this animal and determine, is it in extreme pain and distress, as with an obvious fracture, or maybe the, the fracture is very obvious to us as we look at it. That's a situation where I think we have to consider. We do not move this animal. Maybe the better uh, protocol to follow at that point is the euthanasia protocol. If the animal is stable, not in extreme pain or distress, but does to be treatable, then we contact the downtown management team prepare to move uh, that animal then to a hospital barn or special needs area so we can a closer uh, provide some closer observation uh, to it. Take another one. Here we have the down cow that we talked about a little earlier here. Um, she has no mastitis as evidenced by hard quarters or abnormal milk, no evidence of diarrhea or dehydration. The cow is alert. Uh, she has some mild to moderate blow. She has that S curve in her neck and she's a cow in her second to greater lactation, uh, then we start to think a little more on the lines of milk fever. I'm sure this cow is external recumbency uh, to kind of help relieve some of the bloat, make her more comfortable. When we begin our calcium therapy, be sure to administer it slowly. And as this cow begins to belch off the gas and move her bowels, and we know then that we can uh, probably have confirmed our diagnosis as one associated with milk fever. Then the next thing to do is to be sure that you don't get an injury. So make sure this animal has good secure footing and she's attempting to rise. If she's not up in 30 minutes following retreatment, we may need to contact our downtown management team, move this cow to a special needs area or the hospital for follow-up observation and retreatment. So it makes sense um, to uh, have standard operating procedures in place uh, and to make sure that we follow this same kind of a policy and plan every time we uh, uh, find ourselves um, with an animal that is down. Additional SOPs uh, obviously would include uh, those where toxic mastitis is likely the case. Uh, maybe the down heifer or cow that has having paralysis as we talked about, animals down for an extended period of time, prod use. You know, this is a really complicated one, prod use. I think, and honestly, there are some uses for prods, but they have to be used very, very carefully, and people need to be trained in proper use of a prod if they're going to be used. Prods can be helpful for diagnostic purposes in trying to give that cow a little bit of motivation so that we can possibly see whether she's able to stand or not. It will also help us in some cases uh, to determine possibly where the injury is. And so we can uh, follow up by checking that more carefully. But they have to be used very, very carefully. And they need to be uh, trained, people need to be trained, and those need to be uh, kept, uh, I think, um, uh, and used by only certain people on the dairy because they are, a, there is a lot of potential for abuse with the use of prods and so uh, that's a controversial one, but it needs to be uh, carefully uh, used. I think one of the things that I see in some situations where people don't have access to prods is they use other methods that are even far worse. And I guess that's one of my worries when we don't have uh, ways for 
for uh, working with uh, cows to try to uh, see what their motivation is to stand. Uh, that would be the use for a prod. A prod is not to be used for uh, the purposes of, of moving animals. It's not a routine a tool for that at all, but possibly in, in the hands of somebody who understands the proper use of that tool, it may have some value. So I hope, um, I realize that that's a controversial issue, but I share that because I think um, that's a very misunderstood uh, kind of a, of a tool. SOP for moving non um, uh, moving down cows uh, need to have that in place for sure. Provide guidance and instruction to folks on proper movement and down cows to be sure that um, there's no injury that occurs during that uh, process in itself. Uh, these are very uh, important things to clearly define. They need to be moved when it is necessary. Use a sled, a sling, tractor, or loader buckets. Uh, do not drag. They okay, have very clear uh, recommendations about um, the, the uh, not moving or dragging uh, animals uh, on on uh, concrete surfaces or any kind of a surface. Right? It needs to be uh, very clearly spelled out how animals need to be moved. This is a, a type of a sled you see right here that is used for moving down cows. Uh, some people use what they call a stone boat. A stone boat is a, a flat sledge or drag, that's what we were just looking at in fact, for transporting uh, heavy articles such as stones, right? And this is really a term that is not familiar to a lot of folks, but it's uh, just a drag for moving stones, that, and it's uh, something that has, over the years, um, that, that term has, has stuck with many people, that many people say stone boat, they say, what is a stone boat? Well, this is what, it, what a stone boat is. It's really uh, a drag uh, that we have for uh, transporting and moving uh, heavy articles. Here's probably one of the more common ways that animals uh, are moved today is in a bucket. This is a very good, effective way to move uh, down cow animals. This particular animal was uh, down out in the uh, uh, free stall area. Uh, she was brought in in the bucket, rolled onto this uh, sand bedded pack, and she stood right up. Oftentimes, it's just a situation where the cow is down on a slippery surface and simply cannot get sufficient footing to get uh, up, and especially if they have uh, some other complicating uh, condition. So it's important that uh, we uh, put them into an area uh, where they can get good footing and where uh, we can see for sure what their condition really is. Bundling, this is a photocopy courtesy of uh, Dr. Robert Leader, is one of the uh, things that probably is the best thing to do, particularly where the bucket may not be as large as the one that I just showed you. To prevent this animal from injuring herself, it's a good idea to put a halter on her, tie it around her back leg, uh, and then roll her into the bucket uh, and uh, protect her from uh, damage in there. Sometimes we can protect the edges of the bucket as well. What we don't want to do is move cows with the hip lift, okay? The hip lift has uh, a purpose possibly in, in helping us uh, lift cows, but it's not the device uh, for moving down cows. And that happens more frequently than it should, and uh, uh, we need better systems in some of our areas for making sure uh, that um, animals are properly moved with uh, a better support uh, structure and system. So an SOP for moving a down cow, uh, as you see here, there are many things that we can uh, consider there uh, that need to be uh, considered when uh, using either of these particular systems. Then when this animal gets to the special needs area, once she's moved there, we need to make sure that there's good communication between those two groups. You have the down cow moving group and you have the hospital uh, pen or the a special needs area uh, group, and there needs to be communication there. There needs to be uh, a system there where these two are in communication and can work together to make sure that this animal uh, gets to this area, and when she gets to this area, she's going to be uh, properly cared for when she gets there. The other thing, and the last thing that I want to mention then, is that timely euthanasia is an important consideration for all down cows. You know, I, it bothers me, and I think it's, it's uh, certainly uh, uh, worth saying that 
there's still too many animals that die terrible deaths on farms. And part of it is our failure to get them euthanized in timely fashion. I know it's not always a black or white decision, but this is so important. This is so important, and it's, it's, we really need to have a very uh, good system in place, a good operating procedure for how we're going to go about deciding on euthanasia. There are many things to consider when we're looking at euthanasia. Number one, who's going to have the authority? Who's going to make that decision? Sometimes maybe the owner wants to maintain full control of that, or maybe it's the manager who gives that or she gives that. Uh, to a manager, and the manager can make those decisions. But that needs to be very clearly spelled out in the standard operating procedure so that there's no question about who makes that decision. And then that person needs to be available 24-7, right? They have to be available all the time. What method will be used? If it's a firearm, what caliber and what bullet? Make sure that those are properly uh, determined because we know that there are certain calibers and certain uh, bullets and cells that are going to be much more effective for conducting this particular procedure. And the same goes for penetrating captive bullets. We need to make sure that our people that are doing this particular procedure understand what is the proper anatomical site and how are they going to determine that each time. We need to know that they know how to determine the level of consciousness or unconsciousness because if they're going to use a follow-up step to assure death, we need to make sure that the animal is in an unconscious state. We need to know for sure that they understand how to confirm death, and there needs to be a plan for carcass disposal. Then we need to document this particular information, right? These days, a lot of our auditing companies are looking at not only what animals, how many animals died on the farm, but we wonder how many animals are used in Okay, it's important to keep track of those kinds of figures. So the total death loss from euthanasia and just from natural deaths uh, can be uh, determined. And then you need to select personnel who can do this thing and can do it effectively. You're going to do it um, um, carefully to make sure uh, that, it get done, that it gets done uh, as it should be uh, each time. And we need to also keep in mind that this is a very difficult procedure for some folks, and it may uh, cause some folks some difficulty uh, in doing this on a repetitive basis. So those are all things, many things to consider with euthanasia. Those are just a few. The reality is down cows happen. There are many causes, as I've tried to briefly go through here. The other thing I think is so important is less than 1% of down cow condition occurs from transport, right? The non-ambulatory condition originates on the farm. We need better protocols in place for making sure that these animals do not get transported. Right? We need to make sure that we understand what is a transportable animal, what's not. Dairy cattle that have been non-ambulatory for more than six hours are considered to have a poor prognosis, poor prospects for recovery. So we need to make sure that we're applying treatment quickly we also need to know that once we start to get beyond this six-hour period, we're starting to get into that danger zone. And it's no good to leave animals lie for days and days, right? We ought to know within 24 to 40 hours, in most cases for sure, whether this animal has any hope of recovery. And those kinds of things need to be kept in mind, need to be um, a part of our uh, uh, down cow uh, protocols. Uh, and, and operating procedures. Just in summary, very quickly, down cow management is so important. Have a plan, determine the procedure, equipment is going to be used, and the people are responsible. So write it down. Every herd should have a standard operating procedure for how they're going to do these things. Welfare assessment audit programs today require written protocols. So make sure these are written down and then rehearse those plans and just talk about them, rehearse them, go through them, make sure it's going to work, and then train people on a regular basis according to your plan and techniques so that they understand how to do these things. Implement the plan when it's necessary and then continue to review it and revise it as it is at least, at least annual. There's many sources of information, National Milk Producers Federation Farm Program Manual, 
and form a library. Uh, please go to that if you have any uh, specific uh, interest and questions on how to design uh, protocols. I've got templates there for you to use. Animart has a good system. The Animart Downcal Standard Operating Procedure is, is a good one for you to take a look at. Dairy Australia has some really good information on their website. I encourage you uh, to take a look at that. And we have uh, coming up in the Large Dairy Herd Management, third edition, a chapter on standard operating procedures for compromised cattle. That is in press. There's some good information, I believe, for you there as well. So there's plenty of resources, uh, and I encourage you all to uh, take a look at those because uh, this is an, it's such an important problem and uh, one that uh, doesn't need to be a welfare issue. There's a way to, to deal with these things. Uh, that I think really um, improves the welfare uh, of animals and uh, uh, it's just something we need to uh, put in place. Well, with that, I close. Um, I thank you very much for your courteous attention. I'd like to thank Jan for the presentation. Excellent information uh, for all of us in the dairy industry. Again, I'd like to thank you for viewing this Dairy XNet educational video. There are others found at our Dairy XNet website as well as other supporting information for the dairy industry. Thank you very much.